thank you very much. Okay, so uh, um, welcome everyone. We're very happy to have uh, our own David, uh, who's going to tell us about Simplicer uh, Super Equivariant Differential Homotopy Guide Theory. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I wanted to talk today about uh, a paper that um, Mitchell and I have recently uh, finished and put up on the archive. You can find it at that archive number there. Um, if you get bored listening to me talk and you want to just peruse through the paper, it's right there. Um, and what we've done is we've uh, extended a, a form of uh, homotopy type theory, an extension of homotopy type theory due to Mike Shulman to account for multiple different kinds of, of uh, cohesions. And I'm going to explain what all these words are, but in particular, we have uh, uh, Hisham and Urz have uh, used a variety. This is going to be really long. Wait, hold on. How do I? All right. Just going to do it. If I go. You know the screen setting, so it won't stop doing that. Okay. Okay, well, whatever. I'll just keep remembering to tap it. Um, all right. So, uh, so uh, Urz and Hisham have this uh, uh, system of using multiple uh, uh, multiple sort of adjectives that you put on cohomology theories in, sort of, in order to get at the various kinds of fine structure that arise in uh, in sort of uh, in, in quantum physics, and in particular, and also in higher categorical physics. And these are our, uh, each of these sort of different adjectives here. We have super equivariant differential, um, also simplicial. They give an extra they give an extra flavor and an extra deepness to the cohomology theories that are present. And so what uh, what we've done is we've, we've uh, uh, extended type homotopy type theory in a way that lets us talk about types which have all these structures. So I'm going to just uh, go on. And uh, if you forgive me, I'm going to begin with a bit of a philosophical. Um, opening because I couldn't help myself. So the question I want to ask is, what is a space? So let's say that a space, you know, uh, our first intuition of space is like space that we can walk around in. But in general, that's, uh, that's just a space of the possible locations we could be. And this is one of the ideas that's really due to Riemann here, is that really we should think of a space as a space of possibilities, maybe possible locations, but also possible directions, possible events maybe even um, possible objects of a given sort. So these are the sort of moduli spaces, the curve. Um, and in general, the, the idea here is that a space is a notion or an idea of what is to be considered possible in this kind of domain. Um, and the particular possibilities there, the points of this are the specializations of this notion, the, the special uh, particular cases of this. Um, and what makes space spacey what makes it not sort of discrete is that the points cohere. And what that means is, is that if we test them with certain kinds of discrete tests, we can't separate. So for example, if I take a continuous function on the real line that lands in the discrete set zero comma one, so I take a continuous function R to R that happens to take values only in zero or one, then it must be constant, right? And this is a sense in saying that I cannot separate the real numbers into two disjoint parts continuously. And so there's a sense in which the points of the space are, the points of the line cohere, they hold together. And this is a very simple observation, but it's actually at the core of sort of this whole way of doing um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, very interesting mathematics um, emerges out of this. So I wanted to bring a little bit of history here so I can't really you know, help myself. Uh, one of the um, sort of most interesting papers I think I've ever written in mathematics is uh, uh, Riemann's habilitation on the hypotheses which lie at the basis of geometry, which is only 15 pages and really well worth reading. And it's just incredibly far reaching. But I want to point out this first, uh, this first sentence here of the first section, which is magnitude notions are only possible when there is an antecedent general notion which admits of different specializations. So this is, uh, this is uh, Riemann saying what a space is. It's this general notion which admits of many different specializations 
According as there exists among these specializations a continuous path from one to another or not, they form a continuous or discrete manifoldness. And the individual specializations in the first case are called the points, and in the second case, the elements. And so what we have here is that a, a notion, a mathematical concept is intrinsically spatial or and uh, we can test that spatiality by sort of mapping into it from, in this case, from the real line, getting continuous paths between our points is a witness to the continuousness of this, of this notion. Um, and uh, uh, so <laughs> this paper is also great, even this is uh, in this paper, uh, Riemann notes that it is in fact an empirical fact to the, the geometrical relations of space. And therefore it's something that you can't just assume you have to study it. So it's a completely throwing count out. It's really great. And also makes the really, really deep uh, observation that it's not just the, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of finite relations of space that can be measured, which are uh, to be empirically determined, but also the infinitesimal relations because the concepts of, of for example, light ray and measuring rod actually break down in the infinitely small. And this actually, this observation, um, it's not quite light rays that, that cause this, but it, it's in fact, um, the, uh, not the bosons, but the fermions in the infinitely small that require us to, to uh, move to a new kind of geometry of the infinitesimal, at least super geometry. So this is an incredibly far reaching paper for 1850. Um, so uh, this is another another paper, which is uh, uh, Lebeer's reading of Cantor's, uh, of, of Cantor's set theory. In particular, Cantor says that sets are to be composed of lauter einsen or uh, just units, just ones. And um, uh, Lebeer makes this claim that, that Cantor uses these two words, mengo, which is now translated as set, um, and cardinal, which is now translated as cardinal. Um, and now we think of a cardinal as an equivalence class of sets under bijection. But Lebeer argues that Cantor did not think this way. Cantor thought that mengo were the actual notions of mathematical um, thought. It, it's actually uh, also worth noting in early in the early points of uh, this. So this uh, uh, the uh, Riemann's manifolds are manifold misses, and that term, uh, which I'm not going to try to say the German, but it's the direct translation of that. Excuse me, is also how uh, in, in Cantor's early papers on set theory, how he refers to sets before he set a lot. All these terms are interchangeable. The point is that these are the actual notions of mathematical thought. Their points go here. Um, in a certain way, because they arise from they arise with natural geometrical relations to each other, natural spatial relations to each other. But we can abstract away from those relations and think about just the individual specializations with not any of their their variation with respect to each other or their coherence with respect to each other. And we arrive at the cardinal. And what we're going to see is that by working in sheaves and topuses, we can make good on both of these sort of early thoughts into the, na the nature of mathematical space. Um, in particular, Riemann's continuous manifoldnesses are very, very similar to sheaves on the category of Euclidean spaces and smooth maps. So such a sheaf is an object that assigns to every Euclidean space a set. And we think of that uh, set as being the, the set of formal smooth maps from that Euclidean space. So in particular, we have, uh, we assign to R0, the zero dimensional Euclidean space, which is a single point, um, the set of actual points or individual specializations of our concept X. And we assign to the R the set of paths, um, smooth paths in particular of X. And uh, we can actually determine all the other ones just from this um, in a process uh, that uh, Riemann actually goes through in that paper. So it's very, very related to Riemann. You can notice, read it right off of Riemann. And what's very uh, special is that Lebeer notes that this process of abstraction can be understood as a functor. A functor, say, that takes a space like a sheaf on Euclidean spaces and extracts the sets of points. So that's just evaluating at a point here. And that functor has a lot of adjoints. So it has a left adjoint, which includes a set discreetly as a space. And it also has a right adjoint, which includes it co discreetly as a space. Um, and, and quite in, uh, importantly, also, the inclusion of the discrete spaces here has a further left adjoint, which takes the connected components of a space. And uh, this situation, Lebeer calls axiomatic cohesion because it's, he says it gives a, an axiomatization, this system of four adjoints in which between topuses, in which the leftmost adjoint preserves the products. So that's the actual axioms. Um, forms Lebeer's like, axiomatization of the concept of space, which he wants to use the word cohesion because continuity is already taken by a formal 
normalization. So, and there are other examples. So one of the other examples to keep in mind here is simplicial sets also have the same system of adjoints over set, where if I have a simplicial set, I can take a set of points, but I can also include the zero skeletal or discrete simplicial set. And what that does is it takes a set of points and its end simplices are precisely that set of points to just degenerate onto each of the original points. Or I could take the co-skeletal inclusion where there is a unique simplex between any n points in the order. Um, and so that's the, that's the sort of uh, the, the analog of co-discreteness in this situation. And just as we have this further left adjoint discrete inclusion here that takes the connected components of something like a manifold here, we have this further left adjoint here, which takes the connected components in the usual sense of a simplicial set. So there are lots of different kinds of spaces. There, these are not the only kinds of space that we occur, that occur in mathematics. In particular, we have these topological spaces, these things that are more like manifolds. We have manifolds of all these different kinds of smoothness levels. We have schemes or algebraic spaces. As we also saw, we can consider simplicial sets as a kind of combinatorial space. Um, and then we also have higher categorical versions of all of these kinds of things, which are often called stacks instead of sheaves. Um, but I'm just going to call them sheaves. Uh, and these include orba spaces and orbifolds and Lie groupoids and the Lee Mumford stacks um, and uh, simplicial moment of types of simplicial infinity groupoids as, as, as the analog of simplicial sets. And these are, in, in, in essence, what happens when you take this idea that a space can be a notion, not just uh, having specialized, specializing to points, but specializing to whole mathematical objects themselves. Those objects might have automorphisms. And if they have automorphisms, then they no longer form a set, they form a groupoid. But they might even form higher structures where those automorphisms themselves have auto, uh, automorphisms. These are, these are symmetries, symmetries. These are current physics so as uh, gauge transformations, gauge of gauge transformations. Um, so these are uh, uh, all of these are examples of sheaves of homotopy types on some infinity category, with some topology, and they form what's called an infinity topos. And so in particular, if we just take sheaves of homotopy types on the same category of Euclidean spaces, we get this really great infinity category that includes fully faithfully the category of smooth manifolds, but it also includes fully faithfully the, the, uh, the two categories of orbifolds and orbifolds, as well as other very nice objects. So this is sort of the start of the setting. Now I want to talk about homotopy type theory. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, okay, so the idea here is that oh, we have seen that spaces can be understood as sheaves of homotopy types in general, and now we want to work with these sheaves of homotopy types. Now, one way to do it is sort of uh, a way that's sort of more traditional is to work with them in the usual mathematical foundations where we, we have sets, and then we build these uh, models of homotopy types, and then we work up to sort of the appropriate notion of equivalence for these models. But another way is to actually change our foundation of mathematics to work in a formal system, which is designed for directly working with the homotopy types, the sheaves of homotopy types themselves, as if they were the primitive objects. And that's what homotopy type theory is. It's a, excuse me, it's a logical system for working directly with sheaves of homotopy types. Um, and it's also a standalone foundation of mathematics. And so as a logical system for working with sheaves of homotopy types, it might sound complicated. As a standalone foundation of mathematics, is actually very simple. And so the basic way that this works is we have types of mathematical objects. These are the various notions which we can conceive of in mathematics. So for example, you have the type of natural numbers, because you know what it means to be a natural number. You have the type of real numbers, you know what it means to be real numbers. We also have these large types, like the type of all sets, the type of all real vector spaces, and even a type of types. And I will say here, um, once and for all, that no, you don't get away with, with Russell's paradox, but I'm just not going to deal with it. It's like standard, the standard techniques for having universes um, solves the problem here. And no, you don't get away from Russell's paradox. So, then you also have elements of types or specializations of these types. And uh, we write the colon here to say that A, uh, little a, is an A. So for example, three colon natural n would be three is a natural number. And a thing I want to note here is that it's not a property of three to be a natural number. It's just when we talk about three, the natural number, three is a natural number. You know, three, the rational number, it's actually a different 
number than three the natural number because three the rational number for example is a unit in that ring whereas three the natural number is not a unit um so it's you know as in they have different properties they aren't the same object it's just very convenient for us to identify them without any further fuss and you'll find in set theory that that's a problem that's also glided over as well um and we'll do it here as well so i don't want to get too formal sorry i can't help myself bit of a nerd all right so variable elements uh are the main crucial idea of, of type theory, because what type theory basically takes is the most important idea is that we should actually write down all the free variables that we have and say what they are. That's the, that's the, main, the main idea of type theory. And in, in this case, we have uh, x squared plus one as a real number, given that x is a real number. And so we write this expression, the back end of it is called the context. And the context is simply the list of our free variables together with the type that they have. So it's saying what they what are our free variables? What is our statement on the right hand side depending on, and uh, um, what type of thing are they? And we can also have variable types. So in this case, I've written that the tangent space at a point P of a manifold M is a vector space, is a real vector space. That's how I read this formal thing. And that's sort of uh, the, this is a this itself is a type. It's the type of tangent vectors at P and M. And uh, type theory is at its core literally just a system for moving up statements that say, if given that such and such things are of this type, this other thing is of that type to other such statements, which is actually kind of remarkable. Powerful. So the, the, I'm gonna give uh, three different constructions of types now. Um, so first we have pair types. A uh, pair type, if we have a, uh, a uh, type v of x, which depends on an element uh, x of type a, then we can form the type of pairs. And the, the it's just its elements are just pairs where a is an element of a and b is an element of b of a. So the type of the second component depends on the uh, type of the first. This construction is very common in mathematics. For example, the tangent bundle is consists of pairs of a point of a manifold and a tangent vector at that point. So what kind of what what type of thing the second element of this is? It's a tangent vector at that point depends on the first one. And secondly, we have function types. So again, if we have the same setup, v of x is a type for every x of type a, then we can take this function type, which takes an element x of a, a variable element of x of a, and gives us an element f of x of type b of x. So the thing to note here is that here, the codomain of our function depends on the argument, right? And again, while this is not like commonly taught in set theory, it's all over mathematics. It's very common all over mathematics. In particular, a vector field takes a point on a manifold and assigns it to a tangent vector at that point, right? So the, the codomain of a vector field is it's a function, but its codomain depends on the argument. And, uh, and, and it, another way to think of it is that this is a total space and these are sections of the total space in this. True. And so the third kind of construction of types we need is, I'm just going to take as primitive, but this is what makes this, so far I've just been talking about type theory. This is now homotopy type theory. Um, and what, how that uh, works is that we, we take for granted the idea that if we know what type of things X and Y are, then we know what it means to identify X with Y as an element of that type of things that they are. So for example, we have two vector spaces. To identify them, we give a linear isomorphism between them. So in particular, to identify the tangent space at a point of a manifold with Rn, we would give coordinates. Right? And that would give us an, a, uh, an isomorphism um, between these vector spaces. Similarly, for, to identify manifolds, we give a diffeomorphism. To identify types, we give an equivalence. And this is, in a sense, uh, the only axiom we might need for this. There are now systems of homotopy type theory that don't require axioms. Um, they only require rules that move from one, like this, this thing is a type to that thing is, this thing has this type to that thing has that type. But, um, but the, the original one, if you've heard, the univalence axiom of Vyvodsky is this line and all the other things are provable from this, that to identify two types to give an equivalence between them. I won't describe what an equivalence is, but it is very much says that you have a unique inverse, it's a function with unique inverse images, a unique element in every inverse image. And then the natural numbers, to identify two natural numbers, we just prove that they are equal. So identification is a generalization of the notion of quality. Um, and, uh, and it's worth noting that the, that, the, that the proposition that two numbers are equal is itself a type. And it has at most one element, and it has an element 
precisely when it's true. And this is a really core idea in type theory that you don't actually reason about types in a, in a separate logic. You just construct and use types and they reason about themselves. Okay, so there's a dictionary that lets us uh, translate any statement in homotopy type theory. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Just in the, in the previous slide, how should I read the E preceding like M equals M for, for manifolds? Or? E, so that says E is a type, uh, E is an identification between M and N. Oh, so E labels the type of identification. No, so the colon is like a, is, is an. Okay. So it says it's like, it, it's like an, it, it's like in, Oh, it's an okay. it's yeah, a right. element right. of this type. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, so this is this is it, right? So E is a identification. Okay. Also, oh, that's just yeah. like the trivial. Well, it, it could be any. And in this case, I haven't given you enough information. All right. Okay. But uh, but like for example, if I had I don't know, like if I take multiplication by negative one, would be an element of R equals R. When we consider them, so really you always label the equals by the type you're in. Um, so if, if I consider R the manifold and R the manifold, then ne negative one, like multiplying by negative one would be an element here. Right. And it would be an element of the type of diffeomorphisms. So yeah, uh, colon means means element of. Yeah. yeah. Why would you put brackets? Why don't I? I mean, this is just like, I mean, you guys know that. Why, why would you say E is in brackets M equals N as in like, like Sometimes you do, sometimes, I don't know. Co convention is, uh, so I, I guess for us, this is, yeah, I guess for us, it's like very, the, the colon is like always at the outside most of, of, of any expression. Like it's at the top of the syntax tree if you're going there. Right. Like, no, but I mean, someone, I mean, okay, you know what you're reading, but to yeah. me, I haven't seen it again. Let's say I see E. Yeah. Is it, is, I see. see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Some of this is no, a general, no. a general habit in type theory to omit brackets as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So the outsider sees a long string of symbols and the first thing he has to do is to, yeah. to find yeah, the syntax yeah. tree. What is uh, the so syntax tree? I will say I've uh, I've tried to be very good here and the, the colors will tell you. So <laughs> e is right. of type, the whole thing is in color. Right. And if I wanted to say E is of type M and N was identified with N, then this would be black. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we'll see some of those later on actually. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, maybe I should just be a little better with using brackets. I think I actually Emily told me this. Right. Um, so this is how this is how we interpret um, this is how we interpret homotopy type theory into sheaves of homotopy types. So a type depending on a variable of another type is interpreted as a bundle or a map, simply a map. Um, here um, in the slice, a uh, an element that depends on this is interpreted as a section. The pair type here is determined just simply as this object of top. And the uh, type of sections is determined by the homotopy type of sections, which is uh, a construction given by the other adjoint to pullback, right adjoint to pullback in a infinity topos. Um, and the type of identifications is interpreted as the quote unquote path space. So I want to be very clear here. The type of identifications would naturally be interpreted as the inclusion of the diagonal. So one thing I want to note, you have two variables of type A, three variables in order to form the type of identifications X with Y. Okay. And so you're going to be over X times A, A times A, because you have two variables in A. Um, and then what would this be? Well, we need a, it's a type that's in the, in the context of two variables of A. So we need a map into it. We need a map into it. Um, and so what map would we do here to be the, the sort of idea that they are x equals y? Well, it would be the diagonal uh, because the, the inclusion of the diagonal is precisely those things that are equal. But the thing is that if you're in, like say a model of this uh, topos here, um, then uh, you need these slices to be vibrant um, as maps, they need to be vibrations. And so we can't just take the diagonal, we need to take a vibrant, vibrant replacement of the diagonal. And that's the path space. So that's where we end up with this homotopical interpretation, sort of right there. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, just make one remark, David. I, yeah. I think maybe it's worth amplifying that all of these lines of the symbol, except the last one, were known at least to C84. Yes, yes. This is pretty ancient. Yes. And indeed, the, the almost all of this 
type theory was done in the 70s by Martin Love, and the translation was known in the 80s, and, uh, and uh, even partial extensions of it were known in the 90s, but it took for some reason a very long time for, for uh, people to crack the code and just see that it goes all the way up. So when, when was this like properly made up? Um, when was, the, this was finished. Uh, there's a few other pieces, like the, I didn't tell you how to interpret type, for example, turns out to be kind of a difficult construction. That's actually the main sticking point. Um, but it was only finished a few years ago um, uh, in the full generality, but it was done in the mid 2000s in its first instance. So I think in 2007, Vygotsky gave the first model of homotopy type theory in simplicials in the, in the, the, uh, the, the con uh, equivalent model structure on simplicial sets. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, main, the most of these constructions are this. This stuff is not that difficult. Constructing uh, the type of types is, is a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, isn't, isn't there an earlier article even by Audi and what is it, Audi Warren, who already show that everything is interpreted in a model category theory except the univalence? Yes, system? yes. I mean, that was really the point that the uh, I think, right? Yeah, the universal yeah. foundation. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't really do too much mathematics without univalence, and I think that's why it sort of yeah. But really, it's the hierarchy of types that that Mavonsky really I think added to this, which allows you to, to describe truly ordinary mathematics in homotopy type, in, in type theory, um, uh, in, in a way that, uh, for example, the, the sort of Bishop school of constructive analysis was not working really with what you would call the real numbers, and that fact couldn't really be clarified until the development of Proposition, the correct idea of propositions as types, which was only done by Vygotsky's definition of contractible. So, so really his definition of contractible is sort of sort of sensible. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, all the way up to here. It was it's very well known. In fact, the, the basics of this, you, even you could even go back to Levere's quantifiers and sheets of the 60s as well. Um, so, okay. So now let's talk about uh, let's talk about cohesion and higher topos. So we have the same situation we had for the one topos of sheaves of sets on Euclidean spaces. We can take the same situation for sheaves of infinity groupoids on Euclidean spaces, but now where points here takes a whole homotopy type of points because it's still evaluating at the one point Euclidean space. But we now we are taking sheaves of homotopy types. We get a whole homotopy. But also, very interestingly, the left adjoint to the discrete pointer no longer takes the set of connected components. It takes the whole homotopy type of our manifold, if you will, of our generalized manifold. And that's amazing. That like blows it all out of the water. We can do tons of cool stuff. In particular, maybe the main reason to move to infinity category theory to work in higher topuses is that cohomology theories become representable in higher topuses. It's like the sort of mean and main takeaway from higher topus theory. And in particular, in cohesive higher topuses, this is a cohesive higher topos, just a subject of uh, versus a uh, uh, gigantic uh, DCC thing. Um, uh, we, we get um, differential cohomology theories, which are uh, had a differential refinement, and they come sort of axiomatically just out of the relation of these three modalities up here, as they're called. And these are each given by the round trip. So this one, here says it's called the shape. I take the homotopy type and then I discreetly include it. This one is flat, which takes the points and then discreetly include it. This one is sharp and it takes the points and then co discreetly includes it. So these are uh, sort of, in a, in a sense, three different re apologizations of our types um, and they are adjoint to each other. So I just want to say, like, how does this come up in physics? If you wonder, like, how do you get differential cohomology? Just as a really quick thing. Um, so in particular, we have a sheaf of sets on Euclidean spaces, which is the, the closed two form classifier. It assigns to every Euclidean space a set of closed two forms on it because closed two forms pull back its contravariant functor. And because they can be defined locally in terms of coordinates, it's a sheaf. And so we get this. And then we can ask, what is the homotopy type of the sheaf? Which is an interesting question. And it turns out it's actually quite easy to prove that the homotopy type of it is the second delooping of the discrete inclusion of the real numbers. And this is, a, a, this is actually really fun with the map being the Durham class. So this is the representer for second degree uh, uh, ordinary real cohomology. This is the Durham class. And with that, to say this, the unit of shape means that it has a universal property mapping into discrete types. It's the initial map into discrete types. 
from the two-form classifier. In other words, the Durand class of a closed two-form is its universal discrete invariant. And that's a, that's a kind of a fun statement you can make. It can be formalized this way, and it's very easy to prove. So now, if we take, for example, some kind of symplectic space with a, with a symplectic form, or say a space with a field, like in, in I'm sort of mixing terms here, but it, either we symplectic geometry and we're going to do geometric quantization, or we're just going to start with something like more like, a, a, like a electromagnetism and we're going to do charge quantization. We take some kind of field strength here, say it's a closed two form, and then we ask that it satisfies a charge quantization condition. So we ask that, in fact, in a in a suitably witnessed way that uh, that it's it's uh, that it's a, a topological class is integral. Um, the Sturm uh, class is integral. Then that is equivalent to uh, equipping our space with a Hermitian line bundle with a connection. And you can uh, prove all this internally in the homotopy type theory, which is quite fun. Um, and so this this is nice because now we have this Hermitian line bundle. Um, we can, you know, maybe sprinkle a little more magic sauce and then I take a certain spacious sections of this. And this is now a big Hilbert space, and then we can do quantum mechanics. So this is sort of how quantum mechanics arises out of uh, I, like almost nothing in this uh, in the presence of all these modalities. So, here. so now we come to commuting cohesions, which is actually the subject of this talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, how much time do I have? So, I know I started like. So we have, uh, I think we started at like maybe 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, fine. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, so, in, so now, in, in, as I said, there is not only one way for mathematical objects to be spatial. And in fact, we often want to use various different kinds of spatiality in the course of doing arguments. So, in particular, um, it is very, very common. When working with manifolds to work with coordinates and then you work in not just coordinates you have to check that if you have two intersecting patches of coordinates that something agrees as you change coordinates and maybe you need to check co-cycle conditions and higher and so what is that doing it's really you're working in some the check nerve of some open cover so you're working in the simplicial set which is built out of uh the uh you take your open cover and then you build the simplicial set where it's sort of the uh, the end simplices of these Venn diagrams of your of your uh, of your opens, and so doing arguments in coordinates is very much like working with a simplicial structure that's refining your manifold, and that space, um, which is the simplicial set that includes all this open cover, is in fact a simplicial differential space. It is both simplicial, but it also has the original topology from these open patches. So we're in this topos, which is simplicial objects in differential spaces here. And this has two sorts of cohesion, one coming from the simplicial thing here. So we can just get rid of this, the uh, simplicial structure in our multiple different ways. And this gives us three uh, joints here. One here uh, is the, uh, the so-called geometric realization, or uh, the, um, in this case, it's just a co-limit. In infinity categories, it's just a co-limit. Um, here is the zero skeleton. And here is the zero co-skeleton. Again, they're defined the exact same way as they were when we were talking about simplicial sets. And in the other case, we can get rid of the, uh, the spatial structure, but keep the simplicial structure going to simplicial spaces. And so we have our same three modalities as from before, the shape, the flat, and the sharp, giving us the, uh, the homotopy type. The, uh, and it, it's the component-wise homotopy type, I should say. Um, so you take your simplicial differential thing and then you take component-wise homotopy type of all the things and you get like a discrete simplicial uh, homotopy type. Um, Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, please. What is, um, what is homotopy type on the, on this diagram? Like what is the category? Uh, sorry, what is what is ho? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Sorry, yeah. Ho is the infinity topos of homotopy types, uh, sometimes called spaces, but um, but because I I want spaces to be actually have topology, not to be spaces up to homotopy. Um, I don't want to use that term. So I'm always going to say homotopy type. Um, oh, or infinity groupoid. Infinity groupoid ah. is another, yes. I could call it infinity groupoid. Thanks, yeah. All right. Um, so what is in, that's in simplicial sets in infinity groupoid? Yeah, it's, it's a pre uh simplicial sets valued in infinity groupoid. So it's simplicial infinity groupoid. What do you think of that? Like if it's kind, what do you say? Infinity groupoid in infinity groupoid? 
Well, it's yeah, yeah. It, in, if it's it, if it's if it's con if it's if it's con and it also satisfies one other condition called the rest condition, then it's just an, an infinity uh, void, a really fancy way of saying it. But but for example, infinity categories live in here, right? Infinity categories are these things which satisfy a single condition. And the kind of fun thing is that in if you take the single condition from one category that determines when a simplicial set is in another category, and you interpret it naively into here, it gives you the a, Perfectly good definition of uh, infinity category of the Siegel space, which is Siegel space, but you can add complete at some point. So, um, so uh, yeah, so there are other there are other reasons to work in this post, but the basic idea I want to think about is like often when you use simplicial arguments, you're implicitly working in that topos, right? If you've ever written down a simplicial like diagram of homotopy types of spaces that you're going to interpret as homotopy types, you're working in. Like, there are also other kinds of commuting cohesions which are really important. In particular, to get the proper orbifold cohomology, um, we need both our differential structure, which gives us orbifolds, our uh, smooth spaces where the points can have finite isotropy groups. So we have two things going on here. We have the differential structure that gives us our smoothness of our space, but we also have this equivariant structure, which is the, uh, the kind of ways that those points are twisting around uh, with the action of a finite group. And in this case, uh, uh, this is so. This is uh, to the, the 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 computation here is that the the, the sort of proper orbifold cohomology is given by the zero truncation of a certain mapping space and a certain slice of this topos up here, and that's due to uh, uh, and Hisham here. And so, uh, in particular, um, uh, we have now it's also another pre sheet category in this case. And the fact that this is in fact cohesion, this is a very sort of a truly infinite categorical phenomenon. It was noticed by uh, Charles Rest um, uh, that, that, that equivariance is cohesion. And in here, we can get rid of the, uh, the equivariant. So these are pre sheets on the global orbit category. This is the full subcategory of, of infinity group boards or homotopy types spanned by the de-loopings of finite groups. Um, so it's a two category, in fact. And, uh, and we can, so we get these same adjuncts are really actually quite the same. This one here uh, evaluates at the point. This one here includes as a constant. This one here is actually the co-limit, um, which we can think of as taking the strict quotient of our equivariant type. And then there's a further adjunct here, which is actually given by the Yonida embedding because, uh, because glow embeds fully faithfully into uh, either of these categories. So, um, so that gives us our junction here, which gives us this adjoint triple of very difficult to hand write symbols. <laughs> um, uh, but, the, but the thing that I want to point out here is that down here, we actually use both the shape from the differential and this, uh, this thing here, which is the orbis singular modality here uh, in tandem. And they have to go in that order. So understanding the various kinds of weight, what particular things can we have a commuting cohesion. Um, is is sort of important. So I suspect this, this, this corners have a meaning, right? How singular it is? Like if you took a proper quotient at some point. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you just if you just take the quotient, like the ordinary quotient, that's this one. If you this one is when you sort of forget that you have a special kind of equivariant, like you forget the uh, I guess like is there's proper equivariance and it's just equivariance. And this is when you just forget the properness of it. And then this is when you have the actual like equivariant structure. It, it the, the properness refers to how you, how the homotopy fixed points work when you restrict to subgroups of your actual acting group because it's not it's not trivial. And this is picked up in this is picked up uh, up here in a way that it isn't down here. So, so the is a, the symbols kind of allude to the shape of what you like. The left symbol is supposed to allude to a cone. And you get by quoting out, say, a circle action on R2. But the middle guy is supposed to say smooth, right? Smooth. So it's, Although I, I mean, that's a bit the terminology is terrible. Sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> these things are smooth. smooth. <laughs> is it terrible? Why is it terrible? Because, I mean, because you want to say that an object here is smooth. Right, and then, uh, but, but you know, you, an object up here should be smooth. It could be smooth and like, or the singular and not invariant. I think it would be better to call it invariant. Um, but, you know, 
as in as but in less smooth singular, also has a differential one. Well, it's smooth in the sense of not singular, right? Yeah, less singular than the first one. Right, right. But I mean, it could be it could be singular, differentially singular and smooth in that. Like you could have a singular smooth space then. That's yeah. Like you know, like a like an actual cone, an actual topological cone with an actual singularity is included in here in an invariant way is in fact uh, like smooth. You want to say smooth for the just sheets of manifolds? I want to say smooth for smooth manifolds. <laughs> smooth, for, well, smooth for when the space is smooth and when, you know, when it surjects into the uh, the I modality. Well, the thing is smooth as, as these two different meanings, right? In differential geometry, it means right. differential, but in algebraic geometry, it means not singular. <laughs> and that's what we're really right. But, to but <laughs> even but in the algebraic sense of not singular, you can have a not singular, not you have a, you can have a singular, not singular thing because you have two different notions of the, the term singular. That's why that's why it's like you see. I guess you can have a you can have a space which is here. Let's take the one notion yeah. smoothly. Did <laughs> yeah. you say less singular? Yeah. Or less less singular? Oh boy. There you go. So I, 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 I've been calling it an invariant <laughs> because it is not equivalent. So I, I don't know, um, but um, but certainly we could call these ones orbit singular because they have the orbit singularities at that point. But sorry, I cut you off before the, we got to the third modality. So the one where it goes like this is where you also remember the isotropy group of your action so that you can you no longer get an actual singularity there when you take the quotient. You remember how you can unravel past it, pass through it. Pass through it. Okay. Um, so now, uh, finally, come to what we actually did. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we, we extend Shulman's cohesive hot. So it's it's a it's a it's it's sort of a uh, a a extension to ordinary homotopy type theory. What it does is it changes the context. So remember that the context is a list of free variables together with the type that they have. And what we are going to do is annotate our free variables by what we call a focus. And there's a very good, if I do may pat myself on the back, uh, topos theoretic reason for that term, which is a pun, which I will not say. <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, so what does it mean to annotate with a focus? So if we have a variable annotated with this focus hard here, we say that the variable is hard to crisp. When a variable is in focus, it becomes crisp. It's not the pun, it's just another pun. Um, and what it means is that we're going to think about this element B as varying heart discontinuously in X. So if heart is a particular way to be spatial, then having a heart crisp variable means that our, the thing that varies in it, the thing that depends on it, varies in that way discontinuously. Yeah. Maybe, what, what does this mean again? Like you say, okay, X is a type of A, what does it mean? Like what, did, right, so, what is the extra? information um the extra information so so basically what we're saying is like um it's it's not about a and it's not really even about x it's about b uh -huh. right because what it's saying is that b varies discontinuously in x so let me give you an example uh, a concrete example which i probably should have actually written up here instead of this general example which is <laughs> let's say um it's a it's a meta theorem in type in type theory and in intuitionistic logic, which is really cool, that you can't actually define in type theory in the rules I've told you so far a discontinuous function from the reals to the roots. So, but what if you want a discontinuous function from the reals to the roots? Um, well, we need to we need to be able to say so. What? How do we define a function? First of all, we define a function by just having a free variable and then writing down an element. That's our function. We just say what f of x is. So, if I know that my variable is free and I'm in my normal rules of type theory, I can't write a discontinuous function down. So if so, what I have to do is instead say, ah, but this variable means you're allowed to use discontinuous reasoning. And then I add an axiom saying that if you have a discontinuous variable, a crisp variable here, then you're allowed to do an analysis by cases, for example. And so now I can define the function, you know, f of x equals zero if x is less than, you know, zero and f of x equals one if x is greater than or equal to one. But I couldn't do that if X was just a generic element because that analysis by cases is not, it's not topologically valid. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. So here's another thing, right? If I had in, in when I have multiple coefficients, I can have multiple different things. So here, this F depends on three variables. In this one, 
So in this case, the three very the, the each one of these is both simplicial and differential. They're you know simplicial stacks, differential stacks. And here, this one only depends on the zero skeleton of A. In other words, it only depends on the, the 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 space of points of A. But it can depend in that way continuously. Whereas this one here depends on the flat of B. So it depends only on the simplicial structure of B, but not its spatial structure. So it's discontinuous in that variable. And this one is both. And so this, in this case, it's literally just the underlying homotopy type of points of the simplicial stack C. Z ranges over that. You can think about it that way. So maybe David can yeah. make this more explicit, this notation of the Y, for instance, which just means well, it essentially means that Y is of type flat B. Yes. So only that you wanna you wanna somehow record this a bit more explicitly so that yeah. you're very sure that this is the case so that on the right you can actually call it. That's right. Really good, right. Yes. So, and uh, so uh, yeah, I'll come to that in the next slide. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. So um, why maybe, don't you just say of type flat B? The reason is because uh, type theory literally is a system for reason going from statements of the form if such and if such and such variables have this type, then such and such has this type, and other ones. And we want a system that is purely about that. Um, and the reason is because um, when we talk about specializing notions, substitution is one of the most important things here. And if we had this flat here, but we didn't keep track of that continuity, it becomes difficult to keep track of one thing when variables are actually discontinuous in our arguments. So you have um, to structure in the operation. So we have to structure this operation here. And important, the, the, the main reason is because, in fact, a flat of a type can only be formed if that type itself only depends on crisp variables, because flat is, in fact, a, a discontinuous operation. And so uh, there's one thing you can do to fix this was the one that uh, Erz and, and, uh, and Mike originally did, which was to sort of add axioms that add flat in by adding it in as a discontinuous operation. Um, with where you add sharp as a continuous operation because taking co-discretes is in fact continuous because, co the, because the universe of co-discretes is in fact co-discrete. Um, and so, uh, and you can do it that way. But the thing is that, uh, that, that you, you just get uh, like, like a lot of, you got a lot of gunk when you try to do things. And this is really nice. It actually gets rid of tons of gunk. Mm. So like, you know, having the flat there would be a gunk. Every time you want to use it, you have to do something. And in fact, it becomes impossible to define flat if you don't also have this. So in fact, so just say this is how it, it has to be. It's a type theory talk, so I have to go. Ah. <laughs> um, so uh, so we have two our two modalities, flat and sharp. What they do is they represent the, the crisp variables on the left and right. So this is what Erz was saying is that to have a crisp variable on the left is the same thing as having an element of flat of that thing on the left. And uh, if you can believe it, this is what this is saying. Um, and then to have an, uh, uh, an element on the of sharp of something, it suffices to have to only have the crisp ones on that. And this that's this rule here to form an element of sharp. It suffices to just make everything crisp in the context here, and then form the element here. And so in that sense, they represent on the left and right these two things. And and uh, yeah. So another thing you can think of is these crisp variables are varying in the base topos below or underneath. And, uh, and whereas a normal variable is very up here, that sense so. Uh, okay. So in terms of like, when you write this, um, this fraction, what do you? Yeah, okay, I, I'll explain this. How much time do I have? Sorry. Um, uh, let's see, we've got uh, about uh, 14 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, um, cool. So uh, the way these, these are, this is how type theory is presented as a system of rules. As you can see, everything on top and bottom of the bar is a context statement. Now these are a little funky because we, you know, funkier than the last one I showed you because we added this funky thing with the hearts, but um, it's the same idea. These are rules that take you from the top. This is a certain statement, such and such has such type. And then they go to the bottom, such and such has such type in this context. And so what this says is, when can we form flat heart of A? Well, we can form flat heart of A in the context gamma if we can form A in gamma where we've removed all of the, uh, uh, all of the things that aren't crisp. <laughs> so, uh, so in other words, if yeah, we can have some extra, like flat A can depend continuously on variables as long as it doesn't actually depend on them. So that's what this says. 
Uh, and then here, how do we form an element of flat? Well, it needs to, it needs to be crisp. So what does that mean? Well, to form an element of flat A in the context gamma, we need to be able to form that element in A in gamma, but without any of the things that aren't crisp. So remove the non-crisp things. And, uh, and then what is this? This is a, the mapping property. It's an induction principle, as it's called in type theory. And the mapping property is a mapping out property. And what it says is if we have an element of, uh, let's ignore the, uh, the blues here. They, they, they perform a useful function, but they are, uh, they're actually not strictly necessary. They can be proven from the second thing. Um, so if we have an element here of flat A, right? And we have over here some type that depends on a general variable element of flat A. So in particular, it could depend on this particular element where we could substitute it in. And we have a type, we have an element here of this type C, right? But it depends now on a crisp element of A, right? Then we can get, then we can, we can write this expression. You can say, assume M was actually of the form of this crisp variable and then plug it into our expression here. And this is, a, this is the mapping out property. It says, it says in, in, in words that to define uh, uh, an element of a type that depends on an element of flat, I can assume that that element of flat was of the form of a, was given by a crisp element of A and define that element in that case. So it, it, it's, it's, if you think about it, I have this, uh, it's, it's, this, it's it precisely this mapping property for the unit here. Okay. okay. Um, and sharp has this other, uh, sharp is a little simpler. So for sharp, right, if I want to form sharp A in the context gamma, I'm allowed to actually assume that the context is entirely crisp. And this is sort of an interesting thing where co discretes happen to be co discrete. Um, being co discrete is co discrete. Um, and here, if I want to form an element of sharp A, well, again, I can assume the context is crisp. So what does that mean? This is a thing to understand. What is co-discrete? A map into something co-discrete is already continuous. So a map in here, in other words, it's a variation in gamma that's continuous because gamma has no hearts on it, right? To make a map into this that's continuous, I can make a map into A that is discontinuous, right? To map into a co-discrete continuously, I can map into the actual thing discontinuously. So heart, if you write it in front of gamma, means heart in front, front of gamma screen. means uh, put hearts on all the variables. Yes. Again, right? yeah. So it's like flat. It's it is like flatting everything, yeah. and this this encodes the adjunction between flat. But you can't just have flat because because how do you define the mapping out property with flat if you don't have the crisp variables? Sure. So. Is it, it is you can think that way, but you can't you can't do it that way somehow. <laughs> like so, um, right? But you didn't. I'm just asking because you didn't say what it means. So right, heart, come on. So. Yeah, you're right. I didn't because I also didn't. I didn't actually expect to go through this slide. I kind of wanted to to just uh, put it up there because uh, uh, I had to and then and move on. So sorry about that. And, uh, uh, I'm happy to have uh, to have gotten questions. I didn't actually expect to get questions on this part. So, um, but uh, yeah. So. Just to say, this means remove all the variables that aren't in, uh, that aren't heart crisp in gamma. And this means make every variable in gamma heart crisp. Okay. Excuse me about that. Okay, so um, now I, I can talk about the axioms for some particular cohesions. Um, so uh, here's some of the axioms for differentially crisp type um, is flat modal, which we would call discrete. If every map from the real line to it is constant. In other words, if every path is constant. This echoes Riemann. If we don't have any paths between our points, then it is discrete. We don't have any continuous paths between our points in the sense of that if every continuous path is necessarily constant, then it's discrete. Um, similarly, a simplicially crisp type is zero skeletal precisely if every map from the one simplex uh, into it is constant. Um, and a equivariantly crisp type is, uh, I call it invariant, uh, it's called smooth in the um, proper orbital cohomology paper, um, precisely when every map from an orbis singular point, so this is just a, uh, a single point whose symmetries are um, uh, the finite group G, um, for every group G uh, is constant. So this is uh, 
Um, this is a this thing is actually given by the Yonida embedding. So this is a very much way of saying that uh, the thing is constant if, uh, in fact, um, uh, it <laughs> it is constant <laughs> um, as a, con a constant as a functor. And so in each case, we can internally define now a shape by localizing. And localizing is a process which takes a type and sort of forces it to believe that a certain other type uh, or maps from a certain other type are constant um, or a certain other family of types. So in particular, the shape is defined by localizing at R. In other words, we take all the paths in our space and we can track them to points. And that's how we get the homotopy type. We, uh, we identify uh, points when they are connected by paths. Um, the geometric realization or colimit is given by localizing at the delta one, and the uh, and the uh, strict quotient is given by localizing at the order singularities for all finite groups. So this is uh, uh, one of the the, the 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 quality. What makes a particular kind of cohesion is very much determined by what thing here uh, uh, determines the corresponding leftmost adjoint to the quote unquote shape of this cohesion. So, um, so many things follow from just this one axiom in each case, which is kind of cool. So I wanted to say a little bit about that. So let me go into detail with simplicial cohesion. So the idea of what uh, I think we can accomplish by allowing us to just sort of add simplicial cohesion kind of freely, one of the nice things is that if you want another axis of cohesion in our theory, it's very uh, cheap. You just kind of do it uh, because everything is sort of like every, every statement that's good with certain kinds of, uh, certain um, number of axes is good with one more. So um, for that reason, we think you can just dip into simplicial arguments and then get out of them at the end, which is nice. Um, and so in particular, simplicial cohesion works like this. We're going to assume that delta 1 is a total order with distinct top and bottom, which are called 1 and 0, the two elements. And this might be, not be familiar, but it's really cool. Um, in fact, uh, the, uh, it is internal to simplicial sets. Delta 1 is a total order with distinct top and bottom. It is, in fact, the universal total order with distinct top and bottom. In the sense that any in any topos, any total order with the same top of bottom arises as the pullback of a geometric over a unique geometric morphism of delta one. That's a theorem of Choyal. And so, in some sense, it's like purely just this. And uh, the totality, I think, is, is important to understand. So, first of all, the, the ordering is a relation. So, it's a subobject of, uh, of delta one cross delta one, which is namely this one. You're wondering what subobject that is, sort of the upper half here, right? And so, it's delta two. Um, so the ordering is in fact delta two, and the totality says that the square, which is the square formed by delta one times delta one, which is here, is in fact given as the union of two copies of delta two, glued together over the middle. Uh, so there's a geometric interpretation to this, which is saying that uh, saying that your your cubes, which are sort of the natural higher things you get here, are in fact triangulable by your your two simplices, um, and we can define delta n. As the uh, increasing sequences of length n in delta one, uh, delta one to the n, and then uh, if we have a simplicially crisp type, then we can form its 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 type of n simplices as the zero skeleton of the mapping type from delta n to x. So this is sort of the Yoni dilemma says that the set of maps from delta n to x is x evaluated at n, um, and uh, so to take the underlying set or the underlying homotopy type, we take the zero skeleton. Okay, uh, so in particular, one of the cool constructions we can do here is form the check nerve. Um, so uh, the way we form the check nerve, so just to, to go over the check nerve of a map, um, is the uh, simplicial set formed by iteratively taking pullbacks of it. So the zero simplices is just the domain of the map. The one simplices is the pullback of the map over itself. The two simplices are the pullback of the map uh, of three copies of the map, and so on. So n plus one copies of the map pulled back. Um, and this is a, a construction that just appears all the time. And what's fun is that it arises out of, out of the, the uh, zero co-skeleton modality. So if we have a map between simplicially crisp, uh, we have a simplicially crisp map between zero skeletal types, then the uh, zero co-skeletal image, um, uh, which is by definition the pairs consisting of an element of Y and an element of the zero co-skeleton of the fiber, which is pairs of elements of X together with an identification of its image with Y. Um, that's the check nerve. And here's how we prove it, um, alighting of the, the lemmas that make this work. But I know it's a like, pretty dense little thing here, but it's actually quite simple. We take a, we, we want to compute the end simplices of this so that we can show that it's in fact the end full pullback. Okay. So we're going to map in from the end simplices here, but we're mapping into a pair. 
So it's in fact uh, suffices to do a pair of mappings. We can map into y from the n simplex, and for any element of y, we can map into the thing over the image of that. So this is a we're mapping into we have a bundle over y this form, and we're going to map into the base. Uh, to map into the total space of that, it suffices to map into the base and then map into the fibers over each base. And then uh, we note that um, y was assumed to be zero coskeletal. So in fact, every map from the n simplices are constant in it. So we can actually just replace the sigma again by a y over here by a y. And now we have it in this form, where now we have the zero skeleton of a pair of something zero coskeletal and something else. So we can just pull this out because it's already zero coskeletal. So we have a pair of y, y, and the zero coskeleton of this mapping space now here. And this is uh, this is where we can now use the adjunction between skeletal zero coskeletal and, and coskeletal things. So now we can pop this zero coskeleton here off and move it over here, and it and it, and it rips over this delta off because the zero the the zero skeleton of the n simplex is just n plus one points. Um, uh, the points of the n simplex are n plus one points in the n simplex. And so we finally are left with this, this thing here, a pair of y and the zero coskeleton of this thing. But this thing now is zero coskeletal. Uh, sorry, zero skeletal. So we can just remove that zero skeleton off it. It already is zero skeletal. And we're left with this, which is an element of y and n plus one, uh, one points, uh, pairs of points of x, and an identification of the image with y, which is a way of thinking about the impulse pullback because if you think about what the impulse pullback is, it has it has a, a map to y, and then n plus one maps all the x, so that the diagram commutes, and that's exactly what this is saying. We map into this, we would have to map to y and give n plus one maps from x, uh, from x, so that the various triangles commute. So, um, and one nice thing about this is that we can take all the theorems that Mike proved in, in his thing and just apply them in all these different cohesions. So, in particular. Um, we can take one of his theorems, which seems to be kind of trivial. It says that the homotopy type of a co-discrete space is its uh, is uh, just you know whether or not it has an element, um, and uh, which sounds kind of like a useless observation in a way. But interpreted here, it precisely well uh, with a little you know it precisely says that the geometric realization of a co-skeletal thing is uh, is whether or not it has an element. So applied to this, we can see that the realization of the check nerve is the image, which is the effectivity of of uh, of of epimorphisms in, in, in higher toposis, which is really fun. And so we can use that then to uh, uh, do a little differential art like argument here. So a, uh, a cover is good, a cover. So now we're in differential cohesion, differential simplicial cohesion. We have both differential and simplicial things. And so assume that these are just like manifold stuff. So they're zero skeletal, there's no simplicial structure. And let's say this is an open cover of a manifold. It works in higher generality, but um, so it's good when finite many intersections of the opens are contractible um, when they have a point, I should say. And they don't have to all have a point, but when they do, they're contractible. Um, and in particular, what we can say is that if we take the check nerve of this, we can take a projection on the co-skeleton of the indexing set, which I'm going to assume is a discrete indexing set. Um, uh, and if that map is shape connected, meaning that if it's fibers, are contractible uh, homotopically, then uh, the cover is good, and if it only if. And so the way to believe this is that the co the zero coskeleton, remember, has exactly uh, a single n simplex between any list of n plus one points of i. So in particular, if I look over n plus one points here, I get um, over here. Uh, uh, so what is the what is the uh, sorry what is the check nerve here? The check nerve. Is the it, as as its m simplex is the intersection of m plus one opens in here because it's the iterated pullback. So if I look over uh, n plus one points here, which is an n simplex here, I get in here the simply the intersection of that of the opens indexed by those m plus one elements of my indexing set. So to say that 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 is uh, that the image of this map is contractible means if such an intersection has an element, then it is contractible. That's precisely good. And so um, as a simple corollary. We can conclude that the homotopy type of any differential stack really does not have to be, there's no conditions on M except that it's not a simplicial thing. Um, the homotopy type of it can be com com computed as the co limit of this, of this uh, simplicial set here, as a discrete simplicial set. Um,
because it's a sub object of, as a subset, sub simplicial set of this, as the image. And uh, it's quite simple. The homotopy type of M uh, is the homotopy type of the realization of the check nerve. Why? Because the realization of the check nerve is the image, and we assume this map is surjective. Um, and uh, then we can commute. This is part of commuting cohesions. I didn't talk about our lemmas, but we have a number of lemmas just showing how these things work, which, which actually reproduce uh, the, the lemmas in, in or rather quite a few of the lemmas in uh, the uh, proper Oberfeld's paper. Um, and then uh, we now have the homotopy type of this, but we just showed that if the cover was good, then the homotopy type of this thing is in fact the image of this projection, which is what we want. So, um, yeah. So, so, so you mentioned the focus once and then it's gone. Is it just providing the setting? Yes. Yeah, so the, the focuses are when I say like now we're working in simplicial differential cohesion. What I mean is we have a focus for each of those. So we have a focus for simplicial. Oh, so the focus, focus. You're focusing on that. So yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the, the, so the actual terminology comes because these are all local focuses. And the topos is local when considered as a space, it has a focal point. Oh. And so the focus is the, a variable is in focus when it is varying over a sheaf on the focal point. So it's in the focus, it's in the focus topos. But yeah, you're actually focusing on that. Uh, the other thing, yeah, we can, so it's actually, it's funny because it's a, it's actually, the, if you're in the focus, you are specifically not focusing on that. Right? Oh, you, okay. <laughs> in the sense that, uh, uh, if you, if, in the sense that, uh, that the, the variables which are crisp are discontinuous, so they have no structure. Oh, that particular yes. Oh, so wait, I think the question was why did you not keep mentioning focus? I guess the point is you say focus for the generalization of crisp, right? Yeah. So whenever there was this subscript heart, that was in the focus of heart. Yes. Right? Yes. But well, well, I, I, I stopped keeping track of the. I, I sometimes so uh, I, I would say I started doing it in prose, but I would say like uh, over here, right, a simplicially crisp map. What that means is that really I could have written F colon sub, you know, simplicial mm -hmm. X to Y. You know, I was wondering about this. Isn't this misleading verbiage? Do you really mean it depends crisply, right? Not that the map is crisp. That's it. That's that a uh, dependence. Is crisp. Well, in this case, it's a free variable. So I can say that it, I can, I just asked that it be crisp. But the other, but they, but you're, but you're, you're right in that what I should have said is that uh, we also say that an element is crisp when all of its free variables are. Crisp. Well, it sounds a bit like it's a property of that map. Uh, right? The ordinary person would assume this map be in the trivial context and then would think that now there is some property of the map assert. But that's not really happening. Um, uh, like, I mean, so any be... map in any anything that happens in the trivial context is crisp. Yeah. So, so but it depends. Property of its dependence. Right? Uh, it's, its I would context. rather say that, in fact, that when I say let blah 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 in a in a theorem statement, that I'm actually putting it into the context of the theorem statement. The actual the actual so see this the the, the, the statement that this is the check nerve. Really, what I'm saying here is that there's a certain computation, there's a certain family of equivalences between this and the and the thing of the check nerve, right? Um, things that I prove. And that's my element at the far end of the context. Every, everything else here is in the back of the context. So it's, it is a free variable that I can ask to be crisp, right? Like when I say let f, you know, f, 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 x, and y are all free variables in this statement. So they are appropriate to ask to be crisp. And in, in particular, if I want to substitute, you can only substitute in crisp things for crisp things. So would you also say let f be a map in focus? Simplicial map in focus would that be right? Uh, uh, we 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 backformed focus uh, to work with crisp because crisp is what Mike uses. So we didn't want to we didn't want to drop crisp because crisp is what Mike uses. But right, but it would it would mean the same if we did adopt the focus language? He, I, I assume so. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, the 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 focus is just so the each um, each each if you each different kind of spatiality you have. Is a, is a certain kind of geometric morphism in from another topos. And that morphism is characterized by the fact that it has in the topo, in the uh, category of such topuses, a left adjoint. Oh boy, there's always a dualization here. It would have a left adjoint. I think it's a right adjoint because there's a dualization when you go to topuses. 
Um, and in that case, the other the one that goes down is called a local one, and it going up is called a focal point. And so uh, a focus is understood to be a one of the different kinds of focal points we can have on the top of the scope of us. So uh, uh, good. any other questions? Okay, not the same yeah. as I saw. <laughs> I have a question.